Hi guys and welcome to video 23 in the But How Do It Know companion video series and today we're going to be looking at the concept of microcode. In the last video we looked at the ALU, the load, the store and the data instructions and we saw that for each of those instructions we need to add in our control unit extra gates, extra wires, extra circuits to specify which control signals we want our control unit to activate for each of the steps 4, 5, and 6 of the stepper. So that makes for a lot of gates and a lot of wires that we need to pile on with every new instruction that we program into our control unit. So there is a diagram in the book uh, that John did that looks like this that shows the whole circuitry of the control unit once it's finished. And as you see, there are a lot of wires and it makes for a lot of gates and a lot of logic. So in a past project, I've implemented John's control unit using only gates and it ended up looking somewhat like this. So as you can see, it takes up a lot of space. There are a lot of gates that are needed. And worst of all is a whole bunch of wires that makes everything really hard to understand and really hard to troubleshoot most of all. It works without any question. Uh, the design works uh, the way it's implemented like that, but it's just hard to understand. So I've chosen for this project to use microcode to uh, implement the control unit because it makes for a much cleaner board. Admittedly, I am not an expert at designing circuits like this. So maybe there's a way to do a better job than what I did in this uh, photograph that you can see here. But uh, I thought that it would be simpler to use micro code in this uh, project to keep things a bit simpler. So in order to understand the concept of micro code, we have to go back to something that we looked at in the very beginning of this video series, which are truth tables. In video number two, we introduced the NAND gate and talked about its truth table. If you recall, a truth table is a table showing all the possible input combinations for the gate as well as the expected output value for each case. Here is a truth table for the NAND gate. At the top, there is a function for the NAND gate, and below it, the different lines showing each of the possibilities. Now suppose we were to take a step back and try to define a function and a truth table for the entire control unit. What would the function look like? What would be the inputs? What would be the outputs? Let's begin by figuring out the inputs for our control unit function by looking at this diagram from page 112. Here we see the control section in the center of the CPU. By looking at the arrows, we can see that its input, so far, seem only to be the instruction register at the bottom of the diagram. So for sure that will be one of the inputs to our function. But since in the control section we are interested in sending different control signals to our components, as our clock and stepper advance, it doesn't seem like that's enough. If we use only the instruction register as input, we will be doing the same thing no matter what stepper or clock cycle we are on. If we look at the second diagram from page 112, we can see that whatever is happening in the control section is also directly related to what step we are currently executing, as well as the state of the clock E and clock S signals during that step. So these need to be inputs to our control unit function as well. Now for outputs. Let's go back to that diagram from page 112, the first one. We can see that there are a lot of outputs to the control section. First of all, for each of the R0, R1, R2, R3, R4, IAR and ACC registers, we have enable and set signals. For RAM, there is RAM enable, RAM set and MAR set. Then for the ALU, we have TMP set, bus 1, as well as the three ALU operation signals. And finally, there is IR set. That would give us the following function with the outputs rearranged to match what we have on our project board. 
Now that is a big function, but let's try to build the truth table for it. We will start with a value for IR that we have already seen, namely an instruction to add R0 to R1 and store the result back in R1. By looking at the details for the ALU instruction on page 117, we see that the instruction code for that specific instruction is 1000000001. Let's start our truth table with that instruction. Here I have put all the rows in our truth table for 1000000001 for every different combination of step, clock E, and clock S. Notice that I omitted the line where clock S is on and clock E is off, as that never happens in our clock. Now all we have to do is fill in the output values for each row. Let's start by filling all our table with zeros, as for each line there will only be a few outputs turned on. Now we can fill in the lines for step 1 by following the second diagram on page 112. For each step, when clock E is on, we turn on the proper enable signals for the enable side of the diagram, and when clock S is on, we turn on the proper set signals for the set side of the diagram. Now we continue with steps 2 and 3 in the same fashion. Finally, for steps 4, 5, and 6, we return to the diagram on page 117 to complete the table. For this specific instance of the ALU instruction, keep in mind that reg A is R0 and reg B is R1, so we need to make sure to turn on the proper signals. A different combination of registers would be a different instruction altogether, having its own set of lines in the table. It's a big job, but we can go on like this for every instruction, all 256 of them. In fact, how big would this table be? We have 256 possible instructions, times 6 steps for each, times 3 different possible combinations of clock E and clock S, that are important to us. That gives us a table with 4,608 lines. Now storing a table like this in our CPU will take up a lot of space. We have 20 different 1-bit outputs and the output list is not final yet. In the end we will have 29 different outputs so let's use a 32-bit value to store the output values. So 4,608 times 32 bits, or 4 bytes, is 18,432 bytes. Of course it's possible to optimize here. For example, the lines for step 1, 2, and 3 will be identical for each instruction, so we could put them in a different table and use that for those steps. That would give us 9,216 bytes, which is still pretty big. By creating rows for only clock E and clock S, and ORing those together when they are both on, we can bring the table down to 6144 lines. That is many times more RAM than we have in our CPU, which is only 256 bytes, and that explains why John chose the hardwired approach here. His CPU doesn't have a lot of resources, and also don't forget that it is built using only NAND gates. But in our case, we have Arduinos in our project that can store the microcode table for us and make this possible. Now, Arduinos only have 2K of RAM each, so even they cannot store such a big table in RAM. But microcode is usually stored in read-only memory, ROM, because it doesn't need to change once it's been programmed. And the Arduinos each have 32K of flash ROM that we can use for this purpose. I've already built and programmed the microcode for us in the Arduino, but if you are interested, you can look at it in the file name microcode.h in the Arduino-main sketch. One impact of using a microcode architecture here is that in theory we would need 29 extra pins on the Arduinos to be able to send each of the control signals when required. Fortunately, there is something called a shift register that will make our lives a lot easier and that is going to be the subject of the next video. See you soon!